Have you ever been the new kid? My mom was, uh, was raised in a family. Her dad was um, a road construction worker. He worked um, on the crew and then was the manager of a crew for many, many years when my mom was growing up. So my mom was almost always the new kid in school. She talked about growing up and how um, there were very few times that she got to see uh, the next grade in the same school she had just finished one grade in. She often moved every year. In fact, she tells of, uh, she would talk about her hometown, which was a town called Bristow, Oklahoma, and she called it her hometown because she got to start kindergarten and finish kindergarten and live there more than one year in that town. So it was her hometown growing up. She talked about being the new kid in school and how hard that was when you would move to a new place where you didn't know anybody and nobody knew you and you had to find friends. And of course, when she would make friends, she knew, I'm making friends that I'm going to have to leave in a year or so. And she said it was hard to do. Now, I didn't have that experience growing up. I grew up on the same block my entire life from the time I was born until I graduated from high school I lived on the same block we lived in two different houses on that block one was grandma and grandpa's rent house in their backyard and when I was four I was so excited we got to move to the big house a thousand square feet but it was a proper house on the corner next to grandma and grandpa and I thought it was big I thought we were huge, and I was amazed that we moved all of, what, 20 yards? <laughs> Didn't even cross a street or an alleyway to get there. I grew up in that house on that block for the rest of my time in elementary and junior high and high school. My grandmother lived next door that entire time. In fact, we sold her house when she died about four years ago. And that was the block. That was home. It was home base. We knew everyone. Grandma was next door across the street the other way where uh, a family that went to our church. They were my grandparents' age and they were wonderful. They had uh, this most beautiful dog. They'd let us come over and see this dog and play with this dog. Uh, they were the neighbors that at Christmas time we made sure we went to Carol at their house because they gave away these little Russell Stover candies that were like marshmallow chocolate Santas. They got a carol every year without fail. We knew the people across the street who had kids just a couple of years older than myself and I, myself and my sister, and, and uh, they taught us how to ride a bike and keep the, the bike handles going so that you didn't fall over. The lady catty corner to us was the lady who cut our hair from the time we were old enough to need a proper haircut until we got to about junior high. We knew everyone, not just on that block, but within a few blocks radius of our house. Our elementary school was across the street from Grandma's house, so we could walk over there and play in the playground anytime we wanted. I'm telling you this to say, I was never the new kid, ever. And my mom would talk about being the new kid, and I would think, well, it can't be that bad, can it? And then I graduated from high school and went to college where I didn't know everybody, but I knew a few people. My sister was there. Uh, I'd made some friends at camp that summer that were at the campus ministry I went to. And so I knew a few faces on campus. And then I graduated from college and I went to seminary. And I got to a place that was 15 hours away from home and I didn't know a soul. I'd never even been there to visit before I moved there, and so I didn't know anybody when I got onto campus. I moved into the dorm where there were 53 other women who I'd never met before, and I remember one evening um, in that first week of school where we're doing new student orientation and all of the fun stuff that goes with that, and I looked around at all of these women and I thought, I wonder who's going to be my friend. Have you ever been in that place where you looked around as the new person and went, I feel like I need to make a connection 
and I wonder who I'm going to connect with. Last week, we started a sermon series on being born to belong. God created us for community. He created us to belong first to him and then to belong to one another, to his family in his name. God has created us for connection and it doesn't take much to be outside your comfort zone to realize how much you want to belong to the people around you. I felt that desperately that evening in the dorm. But I will tell you, it didn't take long for me to start making friends. Mostly, that was because a lot of us were new students who were living in the dorm. And all of us were in a new place with people we had never met before. This was before you could go online and find your roommate on some social media site. We didn't even know who our roommates would be until we arrived on campus. And so we were all looking for someone to connect with. And it was very easy for us to do that. There in the dorms, in some of our fellowship spaces, some of our, our community living spaces, we were able to sit and watch TV together, to hang out together, to talk about the classes that we were in, to help each other uh, because we were in some of the same classes and be able to work together on projects and get input from other students. It was easy to connect there because we all felt the need to connect. When I moved from seminary, I graduated, and I, my very first appointment was as associate pastor in Guymon, Oklahoma, out in the panhandle. Uh, it was almost close to home. Instead of 15 hours away, I was six hours away from my family and friends back home. And again, I found myself in a new place where there just wasn't anyone I knew. And I thought, well, you know, I was kind of intimidated by that for like the first five minutes of seminary, but I made friends. It'll be easy. No big deal. The problem was, although the people at the church were absolutely wonderful and dear, dear, sweet people, I love them to this day, I was the only new person, maybe not the only new person in town, but I was the only new person at church. And so while they were incredibly friendly and gracious and welcoming of me, no one else was going, I need friends here. Who am I going to belong to? I was the only one. And suddenly I realized just how hard it is to make new friends and to connect with people. It took a lot more work and energy to make friends there than it did when I was in seminary. And there were other people trying to do the same thing. We were born to belong. We were made for connection and community. And we can't live without it. Now I tell you that, some of you are thinking, well, yeah, but I'm an introvert. I don't need that much. I'm an introvert too. And I still need people. We all do. We all need people. We all need to belong. It's part of who we are, not only as human beings, not only as the people of God, but also as Methodists. We recognize that we were made to belong to one another. I want to tell you about a preacher from the 18th century. Helps if I turn on my microphone. I mean, I've got a loud voice, but they can't hear me online. So I want to tell you about a preacher um, in 18th century England named George. George was a phenomenal preacher. He was absolutely amazing. And he and several of his friends, fellow pastors and preachers, recognized that, that the church was missing something in their day and in their context. He, they recognized that the Church of England wasn't doing everything it needed to do to reach people who didn't know Jesus. There were plenty of good Anglican pastors and preachers who were preaching to the people who showed up every Sunday, and they were, they were I'm sure, preaching Scripture, but they just weren't going nearly deep enough in their preaching. 
George and his friends recognized that they needed to be talking about sin and salvation. They needed to to preach on forgiveness and repentance. They needed to tell people that there is a new birth and a new life that you can have in Jesus Christ. And so George and his friends started doing that. And like I said, George was a good preacher. He was dramatic. He was almost theatrical in his preaching. And he could preach to dozens of people or thousands of people and reach reach everyone in the crowd in some way. He could preach to the person on the back row in a crowd of 3,000 and capture their hearts. Because he recognized that you preach to hearts as well as minds. And so George was known not only in England, but he started to be known in other parts of the world as a phenomenal preacher. And George was so committed to, to evangelistic outreach that he didn't have a local church that he preached at. He preached out in the open country. He would go out and preach in fields, in marketplaces. He would go to mining towns and start preaching as the miners were coming up out of the coal mines. He would preach to them at the shift change. He recognized that people desperately needed to know the love and grace and salvation of Jesus Christ. And he went anywhere it took to make that happen. And revival started kind of springing up there in England. And George and his friends were among the preachers who helped that happen. Of course, this was before 1776. And so there were colonies on the other side of the pond where George recognized people needed to hear about Jesus. And so he became a missionary to what we now call the United States. He came over here seven times times. He made that Atlantic voyage seven times so that he could come and bring the seeds of revival from England to America. And because of his work and the work of his friends and his colleagues, we have what we know as the first great awakening. George was an amazing preacher He was committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he knew how to speak the word of God into the hearts of people, people who never had heard the name of Jesus, people who had never been committed to God, and how to preach to people who needed to be wakened up. People who needed, uh, who were sitting in the pews Sunday after Sunday, but whose hearts had not been changed, whose lives had not been transformed, who were just cultural Christians. And so George preached to them, and revival started spreading like wildfire. But I wonder if you know George Whitfield's name today. Some of you may have heard it. Some of you may go, oh, well, yeah, I've heard that in some kind of Methodist setting at some point. But most of us when we think of those early revivals, don't necessarily think of George Whitfield. George knew the truth of the word we read today from Hebrews. In, in this letter to the Hebrews, the author says that we have confidence to enter the sanctuary, the holy place of God, because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That was the message that George was preaching time and time and time again. He knew the truth of that statement that we have confidence in Jesus Christ, that it is his blood that has saved us, that he has given us a new and living way, and he has opened the curtain for us. So now we're not stuck outside the holy place going, if only we were good enough, we could enter that space. Now God makes us clean and holy and invites us in because of Jesus Christ. That was the word that George was preaching day after day after day with all of his life. The author of Hebrews continues and says, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience 
and our bodies washed with pure water. We have access to God our Father because of Jesus Christ, because he has transformed our lives and is making us holy. And now we can worship him, as Jesus said, in spirit and in truth. George knew that and he preached it time and time and time again, but I think that's where he stopped. And it wasn't until the end of his life when he realized he had done his people a disservice. I want to tell you today, I brought my tablet that has all of my quotes on it so I could read it, and it decided to restart about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Gotta love technology, right? But hopefully if George didn't need a tablet, I don't need one either, and I can just go from memory. Toward the end of his life, George recognized that the ministry he had done, the work he had done, the life he had given over for the kingdom of God hadn't done everything it should have done, that he was missing something. And what he was missing was something that one of his dear friends had not missed. One of his dear friends was named John Wesley. You know his name, right? John Wesley, who had been at Oxford with George Whitfield. John, who had preached with him, had gone out into the byways and highways when George said, John, there are fields outside the walls of this church that we need to reach. And so John went with him to the coal mines, to the marketplaces, and out into the field to take the good news. But at one point, as, as John was doing his work of ministry, he'd gathered preachers, he had gathered lay people and lay leaders, and he was doing the work of ministry as a movement within the Anglican church. At one point, uh, he and his, his colleagues had built a new building, a new place where people could worship God, and they had some debt. We've been there, right? They had some debt that they needed to retire, and one of the, the preachers said, you know, John, if we took a penny from every one of the Methodists, if every Methodist in our connection would just give one penny, we could retire the debt. So why don't we go, I'll take 12 people, you take 12, everybody take 12 people, go to them and ask for the penny. Tell them why we need it, and if they can't pay it, we'll, we'll find a way to pay it. And so they did. They went out on this capital campaign asking every Methodist in the connection for a penny. And as they went out, they realized that they called it a connection, but the people weren't really connected. That there were a lot of people who had come to know Jesus because of the preaching and ministry of the Methodists, and yet they had backslidden. They had, they had fallen back to their old ways. They had been tempted by their old sins, and they hadn't had the strength to resist. They found people who had just gone back to the old way of life, and they realized that this was about more than just a penny to retire some debt. This, this work they were doing was to connect people with one another. And so they formed what were called class meetings. Each class meeting had a leader, usually a lay leader, who would meet with them. And there were about 7 to 12 people who were a part of the group, men and women. They were organized uh, by their geography. So whatever neighborhood you lived in, you went to that neighborhood class meeting or class meetings. And they met together every week, and they asked each other, how is it with your soul? In fact, the question they asked was, how does your soul prosper? Which to me says, we expect your soul to be prospering in the faith, is it? If not, what are your struggles? If so, what are your successes? Where have you seen God at work? Where's the Holy Spirit working in your life to change you, to make you new, to give you that new life he has promised you? And so they began to meet. And it became such an important part of the Methodist faith that when it was finally, uh, when, when Methodism finally became a church, your church membership was not held at the church level. 
your membership was in the class. If you weren't in a class meeting, you weren't a member of the church. Can you imagine that? That was how important it was for Methodists to stay connected with one another. My friends, I'm not saying we should go back and do everything exactly the way they did. But I am saying they recognized that connection is important and that we are born to belong to one another. We need each other. We need each other when we are studying the Word of God. We need to hear different perspectives. If, if I read the Scripture the way I've always read the Scripture, then I'm always going to see what I've always seen, right? I'm always going to hear what I've always heard, and sometimes I need someone else to read that Scripture and go, hey, did you notice that word in there? Nope. I didn't need to notice that word, but you did, and now I have a new word that God is speaking to me. I'll tell you, one of my frustrations with being a pastor is that when I walk into the room and it's time for a prayer, who gets to pray? My frustration with that is not because I don't want to pray. I want you to hear that. I love to pray. I want to pray with people. But when my prayers are the only prayers I'm hearing, my prayer life suffers. I need to hear how you speak to God. I need to hear the words you use with him. I need to hear your approach because it teaches me something about my faith. It often teaches me a place where my faith needs to grow and where my prayer life needs to be enlarged because I hear your prayers. I hear your faith. We need each other in order to grow in our faith. And so John Wesley, when reading this scripture from Hebrews, didn't stop where it feels like George Whitfield stopped. Because he continued on to verse 24. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. You can't do that by yourself. You have to have community for that. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. My friends, early Christians could not survive as individuals who only occasionally gathered together for worship. Early Methodists could not survive um, the, the things that they were facing if they only came together occasionally as individuals. The only way that the Christian movement, that the Methodist movement has been able to continue, and the only reason that lives were changed and transformed is because we came together as a community. We were born to belong to one another. And so you may notice in your bulletin there was, there was, uh, there is a, an insert. And it lists all of our adult Sunday school classes and small groups. And of course we have Sunday school classes and small groups for our youth and children as well. But we wanted to let you know that there is a place for you to connect. If you don't have a Sunday school class, if you don't have a small group, here are ways that you can connect in those, in those places. Here are groups that are ready to welcome you and to encourage you as you grow in your faith. And some of you, I'm looking around, and I've been in your Sunday school classes, and I've seen you there. I know you are part of a class. If you are part of a Sunday school class, I would ask you to look around. Because there are people around you who need to be connected. And oftentimes, what it takes for them to connect with you is an invitation. I told you that my mom considered Bristow her home church. She, her, home, her, excuse me, her hometown. She did that because she had found connection there. For one reason, she lived there longer than she lived anywhere else when she was growing up. But for another reason, it was because of where she lived. 
Like I said, my grandpa worked road construction, and so when they moved to Bristow, they had to find a place to rent. You don't buy a house when you're on a road crew. And they rented a little garage apartment from a, a wonderful woman named Agnes Legate. Agnes was my grandparents' parents' age. And so she kind of took in this young family who had three, at the time, three young children. She let them live in her garage apartment, but she became like family to them. My mother played with her granddaughter and was dear friends with her granddaughter while they were growing up. Even after mom left there and um, was living in other places, they would write letters back and forth to one another. I remember when we went on vacation when I was about 11 or 12 years old um, and we were passing through that area, we stopped and got to meet Agnes Legate, whose name I'd heard all my life but I'd never met before that day. And mom talked about what a wonderful person she was, how she had been such a part of their family when she was growing up and had kept that connection with her family even after they left. When my mom passed away and we were having to go through all of her stuff, um, I wouldn't say she was a hoarder. That was her mother. My mother was an organizer, so she kept all her papers in very neat, organized manner. And we were going through things that we had never seen before, old wedding invitations and graduation announcements and all kinds of amazing things that she had stored away. And we found a letter that Agnes had written to my grandparents when my mom was graduating from college. Can you imagine that? This little girl that she hadn't lived in the same town with since my mom was five or six years old. And yet she stayed so connected to the family that she was writing a letter. She was encouraging my grandparents. She was encouraging my mom and all of her brothers. It was such a sweet sweet connection that they had made. That connection wasn't a given. Agnes could have easily said, the rent is what it is, and it's paid on the 15th of every month. And that could have been the sole entirety of their relationship. But instead, Agnes, I think this was because she was a true believer in Jesus Christ. Agnes saw this young family who was only going to be there for a short time, but desperately needed the love of God at work in their lives. And so she started a connection with them that lasted the rest of her life and most of my mom's life. What a joy it was when I got to serve in Bristow, Oklahoma, as the pastor at the Methodist Church there, and I got to meet people who knew Agnes who had been her neighbors, and it gave me a connection when I could say, I've only been to Bristow once, and it's been 20 years ago, but I know Agnes, and everyone knew her. And suddenly, I had a connection with people I had only just met because of her faithfulness and the gift that she gave to my family of connection. If you don't have a place to connect, I invite you to look through these classes. Find a Sunday school class to connect with. If you look through this and you say, I just don't see what fits my needs, what I need right now, come and talk to me. I would love to help you find a group. I would love to help create a group for you. And if you're saying, I've got a wonderful Sunday school class. I've got a wonderful small group. I've got a wonderful connection of friends here in this church. And I encourage you to look for others who need a place to belong, who need an Agnes in their life to share the love and grace of God and to encourage them in their faith. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your great love, for the salvation we have in you, you by the price that you paid for us on the cross. But Lord, we know that you have created us for so much more than just, just to try to do faith and life 
on our own. Lord, connect us with your, your people. Connect us with your family. Help us find those brothers and sisters who will encourage us in our faith. And Lord, we pray that you would make us brothers and sisters who are encouraging, who are supporting, who are willing to reach out, to pray for, and to provoke one another to good deeds and to a life of faith. We ask all of this in your holy and mighty name. Amen.